I spent three and a half months volunteering in Madagascar doing marine research in the waters off the southwest coast. Those waters are home to some of the most untouched reef life in the world, and yet they're endangered due to a recent hurricane that decimated much of the healthy coral systems and overfishing of what's left by the local villagers. We were there to gather data on how healthy the coral systems were, as well as to work with the villages up and down the coast to help in any way we could with their dire food situation. It was here that I got to see the sharing of ideas and resources that comes with globalization firsthand. We spent five days driving from the capital of Antananarivo in the north, through rice paddies and national parks and deserts, to its sister city Tuliar in the south, and another two days driving to the small village of Andavadoka, where we'd be living for the next few months, braving giant spiders and boa constrictors in hostile rooms all the way. The place was totally unconnected to the rest of the world like I had never seen before. Once in a while you'd meet a boy in a village wearing a FIFA World Cup Champions t-shirt of the losing team, but for the most part, you could completely forget the rest of the world existed. These people lived isolated lives, untouched by the world around them. In our village of Andava, more than 90% of the men were fishermen, and the women took care of the village each day while the men were at sea. They were subsistence fishers, relying on their waters for dinner each day. When the reefs were healthy before the hurricane, there was a balance they kept with the seas, taking only what they needed. But now the reefs are struggling, and the communities up and down the coast were fishing them to death just to survive. They are fishing villages through and through, with no other source of income except for the northernmost village that hand carves the wooden boats for the fishers. But as we traveled up the coast to visit village after village in our wooden pirogues, we started hearing about a French shrimping boat that had been regularly passing through the shallow waters just off the coast. Our biologists worked with the chiefs of the villages to draw up a plan to save their waters using the most unassuming of creatures, the sea cucumber. A deal was made with the French shrimping company, and we began the process of installing sea cucumber farms in the intertidal zones just off the beaches of two villages in the north. Apparently, sea cucumbers are a hot commodity and are used in expensive European makeup and creams, and they're worth a lot of money. Although we had no experience with rearing sea cucumbers ourselves, we began working closely with the women of the villages, learning together about the delicate process of sea cucumber farming. The French shrimping company sailed through the waters once a month and agreed to come every other month and purchase any adult sea cucumbers they had grown for a good price. That was four years ago. Today there are eight villages up and down the coast farming sea cucumbers and reaping the benefits. My friend Manabik tells me that his family supplements their spicy rice and lentils and bony fish suppers with beef and chicken and spices from town. And they go to the city for tools and to re-up their SIM cards to communicate with the ship and their friends. Because they can afford to throw back some of their catch now, they've established rotating no-fish zones and the coral and reef life is coming back. We never intended to change them. We worked with them to find a solution on their terms and provided them a channel to access the resources of a global world, and they chose to find online sea cucumber farming guides and make the most of it, and in doing so, join our globalized world.